Well, hey, good morning, church. So it is church general meeting week, and what I normally like to do is take the two Sundays around general meeting to talk a little bit about church. Uh, and most often that would be talking some practicalities and about things uh, more particular to Rosebank Union Church. But this morning and next week, I want to talk about church in a little bit of a different way. I think this year there's been quite a lot of discussion around church practicalities, and also um, this year I think there's been quite a lot going on uh, in terms of change and things like that. So what I want to do today is just reflect on two things, and that is one, the astonishing privilege it is to be a Christian, and secondly, the extraordinary value of the local church. And, and I realize that to some extent you may already be in sync with that. You might go, yeah, I know that it's great to be a Christian and that the church is important. And you guys would know that because you're here and you could be at home and in bed and like kind of half watching on your phone, you know, but you're here. So you get that. It's great to be a Christian. Church is important. But what I want to do this morning is actually just even upscale that, upgrade that, those adjectives to the astonishing privilege it is to be a Christian today. And the extraordinary, the extraordinary value of the local church. And I want to do that because I realize that in life, with a lot of things in life, uh, we are subject to the law, the law of diminishing enthusiasm. Right, it's a law just as solid as gravity. The law of diminishing enthusiasm. What that means is quite often you'll start out sometimes with a lot of enthusiasm for a particular project or something new comes along. And so often for me, that's things like, you know, I, I get a bee in my monitor that I'm, I'm gonna be like a gardener. Like I'm, today's the day. I'm gonna be good at that stuff. And I'll like read a blog post and head out and get bored like 10 minutes later, you know? But like there, there is this law of diminishing enthusiasm where you get excited about something and important things and then after the excitement and enthusiasm fades a little bit, the next step is familiarity. So things become familiar. And that's not necessarily bad. Familiar means comfortable. So enthusiasm, you embrace something and then it becomes routine, becomes familiar. But then, you start to take that thing for granted, perhaps. So it kind of moves a little bit into the background of, of what is important in your life. And then after that, it just becomes kind of thoroughly in the back, it's bored, disinterested, and the last step after it is you drift away or leave it behind completely. So again, another example for myself is that once really strongly, more than the gardening thing, because that never lasts more than five minutes, but I uh, decided, this is it, I am going to learn to play drums. And even I went, I went for lessons, like I found the best guy and paid money, because like, I'm going to do this. And I was working at a church, so I had access to a drum kit, like it's perfect, I am going to like learn the drums. And I, I like meant like three months and... I skipped all of those steps, went from enthusiastic to bored, and I still can't play the drums. So the law of diminishing enthusiasm plays out in so many areas of life. I mean, those are silly examples, but important areas as well. So I think, you know, in marriage, you talk about this a lot as well. There's the romance and the hype and the love in the beginning, and then it becomes familiar and comfortable, and that's often a beautiful season on its own as well but then start to take for granted and you're in dangerous territory, become bored, start to be tempted, drift away a little bit and then some leave. And so it happens in important areas of life like that and areas of life like our affection for the gospel of Jesus and the church. So you might have looked back on your life and realized, yeah, there was that moment often coming to Christ where it was just, it was so white hot and the enthusiasm was real and then it gets integrated into life and that's familiar and that's beautiful but then you track through these steps and find yourself drifting away. Or when it comes to the local church and again, current, current 
crowd you know, excluded from this because you're here. But you might be able to remember, yeah, back there was a time when you would talk about the astonishing privilege of being a Christian and the extraordinary value of the local church and in and enthusiastic about everything to do with church and signing up for everything, but maybe that's not language you would currently use. And so all I want to do today is shake that up. That's all. Shake it up, stir up our affection for, once again, the gospel of Jesus and the value of the church. And to do that, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3. So turn, tap in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. This week, we're going to look at verses 1 to 13. And then next week, as we do this little two-part series, we're going to finish it off looking at verses 14 to 21. So here we go, Ephesians 3 reading from verses 1 through to 13. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Interesting, on the day we remember the persecuted church. A prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. And when you read this, you can perceive my insight into this mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. Because to me, though I'm the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. So there's a very good reason why I have to preach these two parts, verse 1 to 13 this week, verse 14 to 21 next week, while they have to be dealt with together. You see Paul starts like with a thought. He's got a train of thought. He says, so for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner. And then in my version, and I think in your versions too, you'll see there's a dash, which is kind of like a bracket. And what's happening is he's getting sidetracked. And he gets sidetracked for 12 verses. So just so you know, it is okay for preachers to get sidetracked for a significant period of time because it's 12 verses of a sidetrack and you'll see verse 14, just have a look. He comes back to you, oh, what was I saying? He says, oh yeah, for this reason. And then he carries on and we're gonna look at what the real, what he was meant initially next week. But for now, we're we'll looking at this morning, the sidetrack. And the sidetrack is, it just gets lost in this idea. That's why I love this passage. It gets caught up in this kind of excitement, enthusiasm for the astonishing privilege of being a Christian and the extraordinary value of the local church. So let's have a look at this enthusiastic language here, the astonishing privilege of being a Christian. So it comes out in, there's a very important theme in these first 13 verses. A theme is a word that's repeated a couple of times. I don't know if you picked it up, but the word mystery 
the original word mysterion, which sounds even more mysterious, so cool. And he mentions it four times, six times in Ephesians. Paul will speak of the mysterion 21 times in all of his letters, the mystery. I was made a steward of the mystery. This is the mystery. So what is this mystery that Paul's talking about? Well, it actually is a, a really complex answer, but here's the simple version. The mystery is the gospel message that God is uniting all of mankind back to himself, and in doing so, uniting mankind with each other as he unites them back to himself. That's the mysterion. And you go, well, that's not that mysterious. I already knew that. That is quite open. I go, yes, it's quite open now. It has been revealed. And maybe some of you are thinking, yes, but even before Paul and even before Jesus and even in the Old Testament, people knew this was coming. God had spoken about this. He had sent prophets who had spoken in some detail about the fact that God would reunite mankind to himself through one born of a virgin who would suffer and die. And like, so there, there was this, this was revealed even before that, not just now. You even read in Galatians chapter three, which says, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. It's the same kind of idea that Paul is talking about, that God is uniting everybody back to himself, preached this gospel beforehand to Abraham. That's quite a long time ago. Abraham preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, in you, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So what about it is a mystery if Abraham knew about it, if Isaiah knew about it, and the disciples of Jesus knew about it, and we know about it. What is this mystery that Paul seems to keep harping on about? And he says quite quite clearly here, and I want you to see this, because it's part of this privilege that we have today. So he says that this was not made known to sons of men, this is verse five, by the way, sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed. So what do we make of this? Well, I think what this is saying is that while they all knew the prophets of old, all the great Old Testament characters knew about God's plan of reconciling the world to himself through faith, and they knew about it in some detail, let me say. They had, there was some detail about this. What they did not know is exactly when or exactly how this would come about and they could not foresee the effect that this gospel message would have on a human life and on nations and country in the world. They could not foresee the outworkings of the force of this gospel message. Now, this still may not sound too much to you. Why are we going on about this mysterion? And some, we know and some guys didn't know what's important about that. But it just comes up so much in the Bible. I want to read to you another passage about this that, again, brings up the extraordinary value of the church and the astonishing privilege of being a Christian. First Peter 1, verse 10 to 12. It'll be on the, on the screen, so you don't have to turn there. And so Peter writes, not just Paul, Peter writes, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories, because it was predicted. And it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, us and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news, the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things 
into which angels long to look. So in the screening, in the screening of God's great plan of redemption, the greatest story ever told that unfolds over centuries, that the most beautiful story, most powerful story, in the screening of that movie, what Peter's saying is that we have the best seats. What he's literally saying is that we have a better view of the glory of God than Isaiah did. Now, if you know anything about Isaiah, I mean, I pick him because he's pretty famous as far as prophets go. Wrote one of the longest books and most confusing books in the Bible. And if you know anything about the story of Isaiah, you go, wait, what? You're saying we have a better view of the glory of God than Isaiah, but hang on, wasn't Isaiah the guy who got caught up in Isaiah chapter six, where we read about that moment, and I saw the Lord, and he sees this vision of the throne and the train of his robe is filling the temple, and there's these seraphim, these strange angelic creatures singing, holy, holy, Isaiah saw that. Have you seen anything like that? If you have, I suggest you go see some counselors. Just kidding. But as I saw that, and then one of these angels, he he responds with, oh, there's no way. I shouldn't be here. I'm a sinful man. And one of these angels comes and takes this burning coal and touches his tongue and goes, you're healed. I mean, you had that experience? And he hears this voice. Whom shall I send? And Isaiah goes, here I am, send me. Can you imagine being there? And now here I am saying, no, no, no. We have a better view of the glory of God than Isaiah. No way. But what this verse is saying is that actually, yeah, Isaiah is jealous of us. He's sitting behind us going, well, I want to see what you see. And that goes for Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Micah, all of the above, and many, many more. If we could hear them, they would be saying, guys, look at what you are privileged to see in the gospel of Jesus. We did not get to see the crowning glory of the plan of God, which is the unfolding nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, it says it clearly. This is not just me (laughs) getting all excited here. In verse verse 10, they searched and inquired carefully. They tried to figure it out, but they, they didn't know what they were looking for. And that's why it says in verse 12, they realized they were writing it not for themselves, but for us. And so my mind, my imagination, you'll get to learn something about me, I have a very active imagination. And so I kind of like imagine this, Isaiah's writing something down and he's saying to himself, oh, I don't know what this means, what could this mean? You know, it must be for someone else. And Micah's writing something down, he's going, man, what is this? I mean, Ezekiel, stuff he sees, go read Ezekiel. What on earth is this? I don't even know. But like, it must be for someone else. That's us. These Old Testament prophets seeing these visions. They're going, I don't, that's not for me, that's for generations later. That's for us. And Isaiah's coming to Christmas time, and so Isaiah, he's writing down, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. What? And he's, he's writing down, he will be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Isaiah's going, what does that mean? When will this happen? And God's going, Isaiah, don't you even worry about it, but you would not believe it if I told you. Somebody put it like this. I can't remember where I got this picture from, so I would tell you. But in trying to piece together this understanding of all these Old Testament prophets who had detail, they really had details, astonishing, but just couldn't quite fit it together. Said it's like this. It's like 25 men being asked to complete a thousand piece puzzle, okay? So 25 guys, here you go, it's a thousand piece puzzle that you've got to complete. So that's difficult on its own. But each of those 25 guys is given just a handful 
of puzzle pieces, 1,000 divided by 25, whatever that is. I'm gonna do the maths right now. They're each given their little portion. They go, here's your piece, here's your little set, and they're all jumbled up. And here's your little set and your little set, 25 guys. Now they've got to build this puzzle. That's also pretty difficult. And they are not given the box with the picture on it where they can see how these pieces are supposed to fit together. They've just got these pieces in their hands. And on top of that, they may not collaborate with each other at all. And oh, that's because they are separated by hundreds of years between them. You'll go and make that puzzle. Right, it's impossible. It's how these Old Testament, it's how this picture is developing. And this God, it, person who's writing this just goes, at the end of the day, it's kind of like they were just shooting up these arrows of truth, not knowing when or where it would land, but we all see that they all landed on the person of Jesus. They had no clue. I mean, they had a clue. But they could not see how this was all going to come together as we get to see and we've seen this gospel message of Jesus. Take roots, Christmas, Easter, we celebrate that. And even if you're not a, not a Christian, you know, well, these events happened and historically they're supposed to be true. So we, we see them and we, we've seen it pieced together, but we've also seen it unfold through history and how the message of Jesus has changed lives and has literally changed society in so many ways. And we have felt the power of the gospel of Jesus now that it's been purchased and he's gone back into heaven and the Holy Spirit. We've felt it, haven't we? Amen, like we've seen too much now. We know that this is absolutely true. We've tasted of it. But that's not all. Not only do we have a better view of the glory of God, the pinnacle picture of the glory of God is the gospel of Jesus. Not only do we have a better view than the prophets, we have a better view of the glory of God than, wait for it, the angels. Now you think, this guy had some serious coffee this morning. That is true. We have a better view of the glory of God seen in Jesus Christ than even the angels. I just love this part of First Peter. It gets me up every morning, especially on a Sunday. It's helped lead to me loving doing what I do. <laughs> Verse 12, these things, this gospel message as it's been proclaimed, things into which angels long to look. Not only are the great prophets jealous of the seat we have, the angels are jealous. I just love the word picture here for the angel, things which angels long to look. There's a very graphic word picture, two pictures, in fact. So one of them is this idea of stooping down. It's a word used when the disciples kind of bend to get into the tomb when it was empty on Easter Sunday. They stoop down. It's a picture of angels stooping down. They want to see what's happening on earth with the gospel, like bending down. The other picture is standing on tiptoes. Like there's a crowd, they're like, I want to see, I want to see, I want to see. Like they're standing on tiptoes. This is just crazy, again, that they're jealous of us. And let's just, I mean, why not? Let's let our imaginations run. Mine's already running wild. Let's just carry it on. Well, wouldn't you want to be an angel? I mean, again, if you're not familiar with the scriptures, you think, man, angels, that's weird. No, I mean, the Bible does talk about them. I mean, there are these majestic, otherworldly creatures that can travel through space and time. No kidding. Wouldn't you want to be said angel? Cruising above coronavirus, space and time. These otherworldly beings. Wouldn't you want to be an angel? No, you would not. You would rather be a human being who has got to see the gospel of Jesus Christ and got to feel its impact and feel the relief of forgiveness and feel what it's like to be united with God in perfect relationship. You would rather be a human being now tasting the gospel of Jesus than a flying seraphim. That's what Peter is, is writing here. 
that this group of supernatural, otherworldly, spiritual beings that are far more powerful than us, and that if we were to see one of them, would be so terrified of them, at the least would be tempted to worship them, it's going, no, 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 no. They look into our salvation and their minds are blown. Again, imagination. I, I promise you, I'm gonna come back to earth in a moment. Just one last indulgence, imaginative indulgence here. So imagine, I mean, you know, we would reverse this as human beings, this picture of angels longing to see what we see and angels cry. We would reverse this. Imagine I told you, hey guys, so I'm new around you and you didn't know when you hired me, man, I've got a secret door. Like, I've got a door. You just come to my house, I'll open that door, you can get see into heaven. Hmm? Aren't you lucky? Hired me. Imagine I told you that. Like, imagine there was this thing where you could get a glimpse of what Isaiah saw where you could see into the heaven realms. Hey, who's keen? He'd all rush over to my house, wouldn't you? He'd all be there, we'd all be crowded around the door, trying to look into the heavenly realms. You know what we'd see? A bunch of angels looking this way, going, what are you guys looking at? The action's not on this side, it's your side. That's where the glory is. That's where the gospel of Jesus is taking shape. There's nothing interesting going on here. We're just cruising around, I mean. I mean, do you see, I'm trying to literally this morning just draw back the curtains. I mean, this is not just me getting all excited. Like it really is. These are, these are what the, these guys are writing about. The prophets inquired carefully. But realized they weren't writing for themselves. They were writing for us. And this message of Jesus. Like this, these are things angels long to look into. Which, speaking of angels, leads me to the second point. So the astonishing privilege of being a Christian or being a human being that gets to hear and believe and trust the message of Jesus. And secondly, the extraordinary value of the local church, which really is just the herald of the gospel of Jesus. Our job is to just declare it, celebrate it amongst each other, and live it out authentically in our lives. That's all. It's our job, the extraordinary value of the local church. And again, this has to do, so just prepare yourselves. This is gonna get a little bit hyper heavenly again, this part. Ephesians 3 verse 10. So I've spoken about the mystery and how God didn't reveal it before, and, and so now we get to this, Ephesians 3 verse 10, which Mark read as we were thinking about church. So that through the church, the church, this ordinary, earthly, kind of funny, weird, quaint group, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to who? Not just to humanity. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I mean, that just blows my mind that right now, as we gather, and as people are gathering in homes and around the world, churches are just being church, man, just being church. There is a declaration of the manifold wisdom of God, of the sovereignty of God, been declared. There's a light shining up from here into the heavenly places. You'll be familiar, Ephesians chapter six, that rulers and authorities is used there in the armor of God passage. These are the, these are the forces of darkness. We believe in that too. It's in the Bible. The devil and the demonic world. That's simply our existence as a church. And I mean that our existence, or should I say, our faithful existence by continuing to declare the gospel, continuing to celebrate it together, and continuing to live it out authentically in our lives, by just doing that, the real battle out there, which is a real spiritual battle, it's not flesh and blood, but rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, the real battle that there's a lot happening right now that we're not aware of, and we are on the attack. 
by just being together. Huh. Who would have thought? Hey? As we just do church, as we just continue together, and we don't let pandemic stop us. And we meet and we gather in different ways. And, and I, again, I'm just mentioning this because we tend to forget in the ordinariness. I mean, let's be honest, we don't often think like this. I mean, there's guys watching online, and when you were watching online, you know, we were doing church, and like the dogs are barking, and the neighbor's mowing his lawn, you know, and kids are running around, and you're slightly distracted by your phone, and you know, you look like, and while that's happening, like there's this thing happening. And we're here, and we, and we have to wear masks, and like we're separated, and there's gaps, and it's not quite like what it was, but like there's something happening. In the heavenly realms, simply when we continue to exist faithfully as a church. And listen, I get it. I mean, it seems so ordinary, and it, it is, and we celebrate the ordinariness. It's singing and listening and speaking and reading. I mean, those are ordinary things. But when it's gathered, when it's centered around Jesus Christ, when we're gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. In the heavenly realms and in your own heart, sometimes without you even realizing it. And so, bottom line, we do not want to get too overly familiar with this gospel message in, in its negative sense and overly familiar with the idea of church. And we don't wanna, for sure, take for granted the gospel message and the church. We certainly don't wanna get bored and distracted and drift away. In fact, the opposite in fact, the opposite. We want to drive all of our energy, our resources, our lives in the direction of declaring this gospel and living it out in the church. And so we do, we work for it, we guard it, we fund it, we care for its health with great intentionality. We ensure that this thing, the church, continues its mission, aka church meetings and such. Because we know this is valuable. The extraordinary value of the local church and the astonishing privilege of being a Christian. Amen? So let's spend some time in prayer. And so as you close your eyes and let's enter into this moment of, of reflecting, And just, I want to allow some time for this to kind of settle, move beyond our minds into our hearts, into the place where, where the true action arises out of. God, I pray this morning that as we do this ordinary thing of just meeting together in a room, of listening, of speaking, of singing, of reading, that as we've done that today, gathered around your name, Jesus, that you would for each one of us pull back the curtains that we could see once again the astonishing, feel once again the astonishing privilege of being a human being who's now been captivated and captured by grace and reunited in relationship to the omnipotent holy God through the death of Jesus Christ. I 
I pray, Holy Spirit, that you do that in our lives. God, we pray this morning that as we gather in the ordinariness, just once again, Holy Spirit, ignite our affections for you. Draw our gaze, Jesus, to you in a way that is authentic and full and complete. And anchor our hearts in you. As we go into next week's meetings and practicalities, may everything we do as a church be rooted in this astonishing privilege that it is to be a believer and a follower of Jesus. An extraordinary value of this local church. Amen.